Today we are talking to Dr. Paul Hoodies, uh, the author of The Value of the Moon, How to Explore, Live, and Prosper in Space Using the Moon's Resources. Welcome to Radera, and we're looking forward to hearing more uh, your comments. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, we reached out to Moon almost 30 years ago or longer then, and then we kind of abandoned it. And so the moon was conquered and, and abandoned, as you have one, uh, one of the chapter titles. Um, can you kind of walk us through our readers? What is the value of the moon and why space is important? Sure. Forty years ago, we went to the moon largely for geopolitical reasons. At the time, we were engaged in a, in a, in a global strategic struggle against uh, the Soviet Union. And the moon race was a manifestation of that struggle, that Cold War. So in effect, Apollo was a battle that took place in space, but it was not about space. It was about competing with the Soviet Union right here on Earth. So if you look at it from that perspective, that explains why we're going to the moon. Because when, we, when you win a battle, you don't continue to fight it. So in effect, the moon was abandoned because its usefulness as a, as a global geopolitical battlefield satisfied, and, and that battle was won. So in effect, uh, space returned to low Earth orbit, mainly for the physical reason that low Earth orbit is the easiest place to get to in space. It's the first stop on the way to anywhere. And so when you get into Earth orbit, it takes additional energy to go anywhere else, and additional energy in space is usually represented by the mass of additional rocket propellant that you have to bring with you. Uh, unfortunately, there's something called the rocket equation, which basically means that no matter how you package it with chemical propellants, you get very little payload for the amount of propellant you burn. So in effect, the, the vast bulk of the mass of vehicles, either on the ground or in space, is dominated by the mass of the propellant. And so effectively, when you get to low Earth orbit, you have empty fuel tanks. So to go beyond that, you need to either bring the fuel with you which means dragging it up from, from Earth, uh, the bottom of the deepest gravity well in the inner solar system, or refueling uh, in low Earth orbit from some other source. Now, now, where might you get that other source? The value of the moon is that the moon has that material to offer. And, and what we have found in the last 10 years of exploration of the moon is that large amounts of, of, of water ice apparently exist in the dark areas near the poles of the moon, and water is an extremely useful substance. It can be used to support human life. You can use it to store energy. But most importantly, because it's made up of the atoms, hydrogen and oxygen, you can split water into its component gases and freeze those gases, which then make liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, which is the most powerful chemical rocket propellant we know of. So in effect, the moon's value is that it has those resources that we need to reprovision ourselves and, and, and to actually store uh, propellant and, and consumables for long-term presence in space. So when I, when I talk about the value of the moon, I'm talking about its value to creating permanent spacefaring capability. And most of our satellites that we use every day for communications, for remote sensing, for a variety of purposes, including up to and including national security, reside in the volume of space between low Earth orbit, and the moon. So if you can build a system that can go to the moon and access these resources with reusable elements, you've at the same thematically developed a system that can reach any other point in, in the space between them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the moon is serving as a weight station, as a logistic depot for a much deeper space mission. Exactly. And, and, and that's, that's its, its use in, in a broad sense. It's, it's fundamentally, it's an ena it's, it's, it enables you to create new capabilities by taking what you find in space and converting them into uh, uh, capabilities that allow you to go deeper and further in space. But in addition to that, the moon is also an object, an interesting object in its own right for study. Uh, we found out from earlier exploration from the Apollo missions and, and subsequent orbital missions that the moon actually preserves a record of planetary formation and evolution that's missing on the Earth. And in fact, our understanding of lunar evolution informs our understanding of all the planets, early uh, terrestrial planets of the solar system. So it's an interesting object for study and, and, and exploration in addition to being uh, of utilitarian value as well. 
Mm-hmm. What is the theme of your book? Uh, uh, where do you uh, kind of, uh, what topics do you cover? And then maybe if you can go a little bit deeper in certain chapters, that may be interesting to our readers. Sure. Uh, the, the theme of the book is that, that there are a lot of reasons to go into space and, and for space missions. And because of that, we need the ability to be able to go to a variety of different places. And we can't go to every place we want to in space directly from the Earth. It, it, it's, it's simply, it, it costs too much money, it's, it takes too much mass, it's too difficult. So therefore, you want to start creating a system in space that allows you to access different levels of space on a routine basis. And the theme of my book is that the moon enables us to do that because of its resources, its proximity to the to the Earth, and the ability for us to actually establish a presence there to use those those resources at a fairly low level of effort. So unlike a lot of the, uh, uh, for example, missions to asteroids, asteroids are very distant from the Earth, so you can't really access them on a routine basis. Conversely, uh, the planets uh, are all have much deeper gravity wells than the moon, and they're much further away. Again, the moon is of is of value because it's close to the Earth. You can access it at any time, and it has low gravity. So my theme is the usefulness of the moon, and that's why I labeled uh, I made the title the value of the moon. It focuses on its utility and its usefulness in creating new spacefaring capabilities. In terms of the structure of the book, it's laid out in sort of three. It covers sort of it's 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 three different things. It's a history of both the early exploration of the moon all the way through Apollo, and then it's a history of our attempts to return there, the various efforts that that started the return to the moon and then ran off track for one reason or another. It's partly a memoir in in the sense that I also recount my involvement with this. So I wanted to tell the story of previous efforts to return to the moon and why they failed but also give an insider's perspective of what some of the problems were. So I tell, I try to tell some stories in that that, that may not have been uh, known before based uh, from my own personal perspective. And finally, it's, it's a piece of advocacy for a return to the moon with the aims of using that moon to create uh, uh, the capability I've been talking about. So it's, a, it's sort of three things wrapped up into one narrative. Yes, I'm here. I can hear you. And the recent discoveries also uh, obviously show that the moon possesses the material and energy resources that we need. Uh, and maybe that becomes a permanent uh, human uh, station there to, for other missions as well, as you mentioned before. Yes, that, that's correct. I, one, of the, one of the major discoveries uh, in space in the last decade, I contend, is the fact that the poles of the moon are, are unique. And they're unique for two reasons. Uh, the moon has uh, a spin axis that's, that, that's almost perpendicular to the plane it orbits the sun. So what that means is that at the poles of the moon, the sun is always on the horizon. So as the moon slowly rotates on its axis once every 708 hours, you see the sun move around the horizon 360 degrees, always hovering very close to the horizon, either slightly above or slightly below. Now, if you're in a, if you're in a hole at the pole, like at the bottom of a crater, you never see the sun. And so it's permanently dark there. And those permanently dark areas are extremely cold. They're, they're, they're 100 degrees or less ab- uh, above absolute zero. And what that means is any water molecules that get into these areas are what's called cold traps. They get into the cold traps, they can't get out again. So we had reason to believe that the dark areas near the poles might contain significant amounts of water ice. And in fact, the recent missions we've had to the moon have shown that that, that, is, that, that is indeed the case. They do contain water ice. Mm-hmm. The second thing that's important about the poles is if you're on a peak, for example, near the poles, you're, uh, you're above the local sun horizon, so you may see the sun constantly. Now, this is significant because at the equator of the moon, because the moon rotates so slowly, you have 14 Earth days of daylight, but then that's followed by 14 Earth days of, of darkness. So to survive at the equator, you need some kind of power supply that allows you to get through a two-week period of dark and cold when it's nighttime on the visible lunar surface. So, however, at the poles, that's not the case because you're, you're, these peaks stick up into the sunlight. You're able to see the sun all the time. You're able to generate electrical energy with solar, vol- solar uh, arrays constantly. 
So here at the poles, you have two things that you need for permanent human presence. You have uh, permanent sunlight, which allows you to generate electrical power, which allows you to stay pretty much continuously on the surface. But in addition, you have deposits of, of water ice, which allow you to both support human life through consumables by, by drinking it, by using it for food reconstitution, but also for splitting it into oxygen and hydrogen so that you can breathe the oxygen as well. And then finally, the water can be, can be st uh, stored as, as in cryogenically in liquid form to make rocket repellent. So in effect, by using the poles of the moon as sort of oases in the lunar desert, you're able to establish a thriving, near-continuous human presence there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very exciting and, and, and very useful, yet we don't explore it that much. And, and I guess uh, the moon also provides the space flight capability, as you mentioned, because of it provides the rocket prop propellant, and that's one of the best and most powerful chemical propellant that we know of. Uh, that's, that's correct. And, and, and also keep in mind that, that when you manufacture propellant on the moon, it's much easier to launch stuff off the surface of the moon than it is to launch it off the Earth. When you're launching off the Earth, first of all, you have a, an, an enormous gravitational attraction that you're fighting against, and, and that means that only a small percentage of the mass that you launch can be useful payload on the Earth. On the moon, you can launch basically a vehicle where 50% of the, of the vehicle mass is payload. On the Earth, it's something on the order between 5 and 10% at best. So the, 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 the rocket equation basically says that making materials on the moon that you use in space, it's much easier to get that material into space than it is to get it from the Earth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If, if moon is such a good idea and it has been uh, you know, well understood, I guess then we abandon moon for any reason or we just forgot about it or it was not politically expedient. Well, it was, it was a political decision, and, and that's because going to the moon originally with Apollo was a political decision. And again, remember, our, our goal in the 1960s of going to the moon was not just to get to the moon. It was to beat the Russians to the moon. It was to beat the Soviet Union, to be the first people to land humans on another planet. And we succeeded in that. So on, a, on July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 landed on the moon and won the space race. It won the race to the moon. And because of that, uh, the urgency and, and the imperative to go to the moon had been satisfied. So we didn't go back to the moon for a long time, largely because there was no compelling reason to. And it was also thought at the time that the moon was, was fairly barren in terms of resources. It didn't really have very much. But we've learned uh, recently in the last 10 to 15 years that in fact that view is mistaken, that there's quite a bit of, of useful material on the moon, and what's more, it's accessible and in forms that we can readily use. So that's what's new. It, it's, it's, the work has, has shown that the moon contains valuable resources and that we can get at them and use them in a fairly straightforward way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how we should have been doing these things rather than abandoning the moon, as you mentioned, the three important reasons for the, for the moon or being in on the moon, what we should have been doing going forward? Well, the, 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 the key thing is, is to, to construct a space program that makes logical and, and incremental progress on a continuous basis. Uh, part of the problem that we've had, at least in this country, with, with, with our space program is that it's focused on big, splashy goals. You know, going to the moon in 10 years, in a decade, that was John Kennedy's challenge, and we met that. And that was a big, splashy goal. But at, but at the same time, big, splashy goals contain within them the seeds of their own demise. Because if you set as a goal for your space program a big objective and then you achieve it, what do you do for an encore? So, so instead, what we need to do is to start thinking about space as a place where we gradually and incrementally make progress and continuous progress. So in other words, you want to construct a program with small steps, each step of which builds on and, and, and permits and enables the next step. So when I talk about returning to the moon, what I'm suggesting is that we move from a template where we custom design spacecraft 
we launch them on expendable rockets, we, we get them into space, we operate them for a while, and then they're abandoned. And they're either replaced or they're just uh, abandoned and allowed to decay into a destruction. Instead, what I'm suggesting is that we build a system where we have pieces that work together in an integrated way and allow you to refuel spacecraft and reuse them, to upgrade them and, and, and maintain them rather than throwing them away. So we're moving from a, a template of one-off missions with throwaway spacecraft to one of continuous presence and continuous maintenance and use. And it's, it's a different way of operating. It's much more comparable to, say, a terrestrial railroad system than it is to the development of an experimental jet aircraft. The early space program was comparable to that, to, to developing experimental aircraft that fly once and then don't get used again, to one of a more general nature where you've got an, a transportation infrastructure that's used continuously, that's maintained, that's refueled, and parts are, no, are only thrown away when they wear out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, the competing idea in the space missions always had been Mars, that Mars was more important. And, and there have been many efforts in that. Uh, would you kind of give the comparative reasons why Moon is equally or more important rather than Mars? Mars is further away from Moon, it's more complex, it's expensive, but uh, there are other nuances that you can highlight. Yes, I mean, it, it, it's, it's logical to think if, if you're building a program around big splashy goals, then one logical corollary of that is that you need to go someplace new every time you go. So a lot of the criticism of returning to the moon are, uh, appeals to the argument that, well, we've been to the moon. But th there's a difference here, and that difference is, is that we're not going to the moon to show that we can do it. We're going to the moon to start creating new capabilities that we don't have right now. And that's a slightly, that's a different objective than what we had before. The problem with, with Mars as an immediate objective is that fundamentally we can't do it right now. It's, we don't have the technology, we don't have the money, and we don't have the political will to commit to a 30-year program to basically put people on Mars. And that, that actually creates a bit of a problem. If, if, and the people that want to go to Mars immediately tend to have mission designs that look very Apollo-like. Uh, you build a giant booster rocket, you launch pieces to, to space, they rendezvous, they go to Mars, they land, you throw away the pieces of the spacecraft as you go, and then finally you return, maybe with some samples, maybe with some, some scientific data, but you, the people and the data and the samples return in a small capsule-like vehicle that re-enters the Earth, just like Apollo did, and it lands in the ocean and it's picked up. Now, the problem with that mode of operation is that effectively you're discarding all of your capital equipment for each given mission. And that's fine if you're just going to go once or if you're just going to go a couple times. If you want to go more than that, and remember Mars as a, as a planet has a land area that's as big as the combined continents of all the Earth, uh, effectively that's going to run into a, a money problem. You don't have the money to afford that kind of a space program. Now instead, another way to look at this is why don't we develop a system, a, a space transportation system that can routinely access the moon and other points in cislunar space, and instead of trying to launch all the mass of the Mars vehicle, which by the way would be well over a million pounds in low Earth orbit, uh, of which four-fifths of that is rocket propellant, get that rocket propellant, the most massive part and, and, and the largest fraction of the Mars spacecraft from the moon, which is much easier to get material out of than, than the Earth is. So I look upon a return to the moon for the purposes I've described in the book, not as a diversion from a mission to Mars, but rather as an enabling step toward it. Because if you don't do that, you're going to be doomed to repeat the experience of Apollo, which effectively allows you to go to the planet once, but then you never get to go again, because effectively it costs too much. Mm -hmm. Well, why going to Mars is important? Just because it's distant, just because it's complex, just because it's difficult, and that's why it's important to overcome those challenges? Or there are certain material resource reasons that can benefit us? Well, there's, there's an interest in Mars because it is thought to be very Earth-like. 
and and you know we have one planet in the solar system that we know where life formed and evolved, and that's the Earth. We know that because we're here and we see it, and we we sort of know from the fossil record how that came about and how life evolved. There's a big question in science as to whether that happened on any other planet or any other planet, not only in the solar system, but in space in general. Now, the reason that Mars has drawn attention is that it appears to be very Earth-like. It has an atmosphere. It has a a 24-hour day. It's made up pretty much of the same elements as the Earth. It had liquid water at one point in the past, which is known to be a requirement for life. So all these things add up to the idea that Mars might have been a place where life evolved independently. Life might have evolved in the earliest history of the planet there, just as it did here. And if that's true, that would be interesting to look at as a comparative uh, uh, example. Uh, It would tell us a lot about how, what conditions are needed for the formation and evolution of life. So that's why the interest in Mars, that's why it's always drawn that interest. And, And that I don't deny that those are valid scientific objectives, but there are a lot of other scientific questions as well. It's it's not just life is the only question to be answered by exploring space. We want to know about the origins and evolutions of all the planets. But the way to get that, I think, is to develop the ability to go in space wherever we want, whenever we want, for whatever mission we want to do. And the way to do that is to develop a permanent space-based transportation system that gives you that capability. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it makes a lot of sense, and it's very logical, yet the politicians and have different objectives or just are not even focused on it, I guess. Well, it, it's not that so much as that if, if, you, if you come up with a good, simple catchphrase, like searching for life, that's something that people can grasp and, and, and understand fairly easily. And, and building new capability using the moon's resources is a little bit more subtle. And that's why I wrote the book. I wanted to explain that it's not magic and it's not voodoo. It's simple, basic uh, 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 chemistry and physics. It's the way the moon's put together. And it's, it's, space is a difficult environment to travel in simply because it's, it's alien. It's hostile to, to human life. We have to bring our own life support with us. And it requires energy to move around to the various levels of space that we're interested in. And one way to address that issue, instead of taking it all up with us from Earth, is to use what we find in space to, to enable us to do some of this stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If we are not doing it, you know, there are other humans on this Earth, the Russians, the Chinese, the Europeans, Indians. Are they looking at this thing as a viable? Huh? Ab- absolutely. And, and, in, and in fact, all the entities you mention have a lunar interest and lunar missions of one type or another. Uh, the Indians have already sent a mission to the moon. Chandrayaan one was an orbital mission, and in fact, I was I had the honor of, of being a part of that mission. I flew an, an imaging radar experiment on Chandrayaan one that the Indians flew for us, and uh, were able to map the poles of the moon to actually confirm that there is ice there. So, uh, in addition, the Russians have, of course, had their own moon program for for many decades. Uh, of course, we were racing them to the moon in the 60s. They subsequently sent rovers and landers to return samples to the moon. And right now they're talking about uh, sending a, uh, a probe to the poles of the moon in the next few years. They're, in fact, going to collaborate with the European Space Agency, the uh, ESA, which is a consortium of all the European countries, uh, who are actually very interested in human lunar return. So the, the Europeans are talking about creating something called a moon village which is basically a collection of robotic assets that will evolve into a, a human outpost. And uh, in fact, I just returned from a meeting in London earlier this month where that was discussed again. And then finally, you mentioned the Chinese, and of course the Chinese are, have a very vigorous lunar program going. They've flown uh, four missions, robotic missions to the moon, including a lander and some orbiters. And in fact, they're preparing for a lunar sample return mission here in the next couple of years with ultimately looking at human lunar missions within within a decade or so. So all the nations of the world are, are interested in the moon and are going to the moon, apparently, except for the United States, and, and for no good reason other than it was, de- it was uh, decreed as a, as a policy without any real debate or understanding of the issues involved. So where do we go from here? 
Well, I think the uh, what I'm trying to do is to is to sort of raise consciousness, is to inform people about what we what we now know about the moon, its value in terms of what it gives us, what kinds of capabilities it gives us, and what we can imagine using it for, and then finally, hopefully, get started by by sending a few small robotic missions to flesh out our knowledge of the poles of the moon. So. My part, anyway, at least what I'm trying to do, is to uh, spread the good word and uh, hopefully uh, convince people that this is something uh, worth considering. How did you get in, in, involved or interested in the, in the moon and lunar missions and space missions? Uh, share us some of your background and, and so our uh, readers can understand a little bit more about the man behind the book. I was a kid in the 1960s, and I was a, a, just a space buff. I mean, I just ate it up. I, I loved everything about it. I would watch the missions on TV. I built model rockets. I studied astronomy. I did everything that a lot of my my peers of the same age did back in the 1960s. And when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, I thought that this was the beginning of a great new age of space, that we would basically go out and colonize the solar system. So I prepared uh, for a professional career in my education by majoring in science and going into converging on geology because I thought that was the most interesting thing. I got interested in the moon at a very early age and my, my, my uh, graduate school work was on the geology of the moon and that's how I got into the planetary science business. Uh, I've worked at the U.S. Geological Survey in Flagstaff. I've worked uh, here at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston, and uh, even at uh, and also a short time at uh, the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins uh, back in in Maryland. And uh, at all of those places, I've been involved in efforts to either fly a lunar mission, fly an experiment, or advocate for for lunar return. So I got into the space business originally because I kind of dreamed that I wanted to go into space. But as the years went on, I realized that wasn't likely. So what I focused on instead was sending experiments and, and instruments uh, to the moon that would give me data to allow us to plan for an eventual human return. So I've, I've been involved in the, uh, the attempts to get a lunar base going for about the last 20 years, 25 years, I guess it's been. And uh, we're not there yet, but I haven't given up yet either. So uh, I just think it's 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 the logical thing to do. It makes the most sense. And uh, if I can be a part of getting humanity on that course, uh, I will be more than happy. Are you working on any other books, or are you working on any other topics that you will be uh, uh, sharing more with the general public or with the enthusiasts? Well, one of one of the things that I describe in the book is is a plan that I came up. I worked with a, a guy at NASA Marshall, called uh, who called Tony named Tony Lavoy, and Tony and I came up with an architecture that kind of allows us to get back on the moon for for a minimal amount of effort. And in fact, he and I right now are are working on a revision of that idea. So I've sort of taken the plan that I outline in the book, and I'm fleshing it out to a greater degree of detail and hopefully uh, improving on it a bit so that the story gets even more compelling. And uh, we'll be publishing on that probably sometime before the end of the year. We'll publish a professional paper on that showing how we've taken the architecture that we published a few years ago and we've expanded it and hopefully improved it. Do you think that the politicians will find or the willpower will be there to get back to Moon if there are certain discoveries that could happen along the way, either by us or somebody else? I, I think, I think yes. I, I, I talk to a lot of politicians. I, I've testified to both the Senate and the House uh, in Congress. I've worked with the executive branch, and a lot of people in government understand this argument. They understand the value of the Moon. I think it's just getting a critical mass is what we're trying to do now. We're, more and more people are listening to the story and they see the logic in it. So I think ultimately there is hope to kind of get us on the right path again. Uh, as, turned, as you mentioned, the, there is an international contingent that is very interested in going to the moon that has not gone unnoticed in Washington. So it may well be that this time we go back to the moon, but it's it's the international groups that are leading us and not the United States. Uh, hopefully, I can get them more interested as time goes on. I think there is a possibility that that, that, could, be, that could happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much for your time and your comments. And the book is very exciting, and the topic itself is, is very, very exciting. And I'm sure uh, somehow, somewhere, some human organizations will find a way to reach and make a permanent mission on the moon. And we have been talking to Dr. Paul Spurdis, the author of The Value of the Moon, How to Explore, Live, and Prosper in Space Using the Moon's Resources. Thank you again. Thank you very much. And hopefully we can talk to you again when you have another book coming down the line. All right. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thanks for calling. Thank you.